Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. You know, everybody likes to get something free. We have something that we're offering today on our telecast that is free of charge and is postpaid, and it will come to you in the mail, and it won't cost you anything at all. It's free. We're offering today on this telecast a DVD entitled, Why Are There So Many Churches? Please write for it or call for it at the 800 number that will be appearing throughout the program today. Have you ever really wondered why there are so many churches? And why is it that uh, we have on every corner, just about in every city, a, a, a multiplicity of churches all professing to be the church of the Bible, yet they're all different in a multiplicity of ways? That's a big mystery. Do you know Paul in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 speaks of the mystery of godliness? This morning we're going to pursue that thought together. And uh, you know there is something real mysterious, there's things that we don't know. People always say, well, you know, we'll understand all the mysteries by and by. That's just not true and God never said we would. There are some things that God may never reveal unto us, but he has revealed the word of God unto us. It is called the Logos in the Greek. And the Word of God gives us information regarding how we're to honor God, how we're to serve Him here, to worship Him, and how we're to obey Him, and ultimately how we get to heaven. We're going to call upon uh, several panelists this morning here on Give Me the Bible. And uh, we're going to ask them if they would to share with us the Word of God concerning this mystery of godliness. Our first panel this morning is Rocky Whiteley from down at Bryan College Station, Texas. And Rocky, please begin our discussion. Thank you, Dan. And it's good to be with all of you today. As we look at this important verse, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it starts out, God was manifested in the flesh. And there's no question as a preacher of Christ that we all want to tell the story of Jesus, much like the song that we sing. We stop and think here about these words, that God has come to our earth, that the Creator has visited creation. It's just amazing to me that God thinks that much of us, that He would actually send His Son to this earth. We see the words of David in Psalm 8 and verse 4, the writer of Hebrews quotes this in Hebrews chapter 2. What is man that you are mindful of him, or son of man that you visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. This is Jesus that we're talking about, how that he left the glories of heaven to come to this earth to live and walk among us. We see Isaiah predicting this some, uh, some thousands of years ago in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. How that a woman, a virgin, would conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. And we learn from Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, uh, that this means God with us. And of course, the word that was given to, given to Joseph when he found out that Mary was going to bear a child was that he was told uh, in verse 21 uh, that you're to give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. It's an amazing name because it means God saves. The very name that he's given his son is going to be what his son does for each of us. God manifests in the flesh. He's come to be our Savior. We look at John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
And skipping on down to verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Here's Jesus come in the flesh and he is God's way of reconciling man to himself. We see, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses, 19, uh, verses 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us this message of reconciliation. This is the message that we bring. God manifest in the flesh, we preach Jesus our Savior. Thank God he came to this earth. Dan? Thank you, Rocky. And what a joy it is to be able to share this same message that Jesus shared with the world and the Holy Spirit preserved through the giving of the Word of God with all of you that are listening here this morning. How grateful and how thankful we really are. You know, Joe Hancock is uh, one of our wonderful panelists this morning, and we're happy that he is here. And uh, Joe, this passage also says that, uh, you know, we he was justified in the Spirit. Now, the justification he's talking about is not our justification, but he's talking about the fact that Jesus was justified in the Holy Spirit. And that, I think, just simply takes on a little bit different uh, concept also. Would you share with us what that passage actually means? Thanks, Dan. I'd be glad to. Good morning, folks. Glad to have you with us again this morning. Glad to be in your living room or wherever it is your television happens to be this morning. You know, Dan, the, the word justified normally means to, to make or declare righteous, to make or declare to be righteous. Uh, Jesus certainly was righteous. Uh, we are justified or made righteous uh, through Christ by God's will. Uh, he, he's declared that, that righteousness would, uh, even though we deserve death because of our sins, righteousness would be given to us through Jesus Christ. Uh, so, you know, these, Jesus did not need to be justified or made to be righteous like we do. Uh, Jesus was righteous. Now, there, on the word justified, where, where Jesus is said to be justified in the Spirit, uh, there's two different ways of looking at that. I'll share them both with you, and you can decide which one you favor or not. Uh, we won't change the Scriptures to what the Scriptures say, but we'll look at a couple of other passages that have to do with this topic. Uh, either Jesus was vindicated by the Holy Spirit, or Jesus vindicated or made righteous by His Spirit, or through His uh, mannerisms, His life, and, and so forth. Uh, Vindicated by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's who testified of Jesus being God's only Son. Matthew 3 and verse 16, when Jesus had been baptized, uh, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him and saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Uh, he, Jesus cast out demons by means or by way of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12 and verse 28, but it came, but I cast. Excuse me. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Those were Jesus' words. He was also vindicated by his own Spirit. John 7, at verse 28 and 29, Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Jesus talking about the Father sending him uh, to be our salvation factor, our propitiation, as it were. Jesus' works, the things he did and the things he taught, definitely proved that he was working on behalf of or in the name of God the Father. And the resurrection of Jesus is, is the epitome of justification of him being righteous, him being justified, him being the only son of the Father in heaven, uh, him being the only salvation that we could have or ever have had. Uh, there's no other name under heaven that we might be saved other than Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. You know, Dan, whichever of those two uh, ideas you look at in the way of Jesus being vindicated by the Spirit or in the Spirit, uh, surely the Scriptures prove the fact that his righteousness is beyond question. Uh, the Son of God uh, is justified. 
Dan? Well, Joe, you're exactly right. And uh, you remember Jesus said when they came to him and said, we would see the Father. Uh, Why, well, Jesus just simply said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Well, let's go on this morning from that passage found in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and uh, verse 15 to 16 there. Uh, you know, Paul, in writing to this young minister, is reminding him of a number of things. One of them uh, is the fact that Christ was seen by angels also, he mentions. So uh, we're going to ask Randy Foreman. Uh, Randy, what is really meant by that? Well, thank you, Dan, for having me on the program this morning. You know, that, as you mentioned, the uh, mystery is that Jesus was seen by angels. We need to notice in Luke 1, 26, that the angel Gabriel announced the birth of Jesus. Angels ministered to Jesus after he was tempted in the wilderness, Matthew 4 and verse 11. And then too, Jesus was strengthened by an angel in the garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22, 43. Also, angels appeared when Jesus ascended back into heaven. And angels will also accompany Jesus when he returns at the resurrection, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. 1 Timothy 3, 16. You see, here Paul either recites a hymn or summarizes the content. Either way, he lists for Timothy the main points and the major ideas of the teaching of the gospel. The truth or the mystery of godliness, he says, can be summarized in those following ways. Not only was Jesus' resurrection witnessed by hundreds of people here on earth, it was also witnessed by those in the spiritual realm as well as those seen by angels. But Mary, according to John 20, 11, through, uh, 11 and 12, was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stopped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head of one of the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. You see, even Satan, who was created as an angelic being, is aware of Jesus' resurrection, as well as the angels in heaven. Both the physical and the spirit world have witnessed the resurrection of Christ. So Paul writes this letter to Timothy so that he might know how to conduct himself in God's house or in God, under God's family, which is the church of Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 3.15. The church, then, is the pillar of the truth, and it supports the truth that God has revealed to man. This truth is called a mystery in the next verse. It's called a mystery because for many centuries, God's will for humanity was concealed. But now the mystery has been revealed through Christ. Of note is that a majority of the problems in the Christian world are a direct result of violating those principles. At the beginning, you notice I mentioned 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Allow me to read. When the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And so you and I need to do, go do good. Back to you, Dan. Randy, isn't it a wonderful thought to know that someday we're going to be able to go to heaven and be with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, it is a thrilling thing when you stop to consider uh, how wonderful it is to be a child of Almighty God. <clears throat> we want to go to our next panelist right now with the Perry Cowan. And uh, Perry, uh, one of the statements that Paul makes here to Timothy or writes to him is that uh, the gospel is preached to the Gentiles. Now, would you explain, first of all, who the Gentiles are and then talk a little bit about why that's such an important thing? Certainly. Uh, the Gentiles, they, they were people who were not Jews. That's, that's basically everyone uh, who is not of the Jewish nation. And uh, the gospel was presented first to the Jews 
as has been directed by Jesus Christ. Uh, but it was preached among the Gentiles as he had directed it be done. Paul declared in Romans chapter 1, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation uh, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Gentiles. King James says also for the Greek, uh, but uh, they were not Jews. But th this was just as it had been prophesied, just as it had been foretold by the Lord himself in Acts chapter 1, as he was addressing his uh, apostles and instructing them to await in Jerusalem. He said, you wait there and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That's, that's the central part of the Jews. And then he said, and in all of Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, all people, Jews, Gentiles alike, were to receive this gospel message. So although it was first preached in Jerusalem, just as it had been directed that it do, then it spread out to other places, Samaria, Judea, and all throughout the world, we need to understand that it was not a message just for the Jews. It was a message for you and a message for me and all who have ever lived. You know, the central truth of the gospel uh, that was preached by the, the, uh, the Lord's apostles uh, that was foretold by the prophets was the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, that's exactly how Paul described it, uh, defined it, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you also stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed it in vain, he said, here's what it is. I preached to you the gospel. I delivered to you, preached to you, first of all, that which I received. Well, what did Paul receive? He received it from Christ, according to Galatians chapter 1. And he said, I received that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now he declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Friends, that's our mission as well as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Dan? Perry, you know, one of the most remarkable things about this mystery uh, is the fact that people believed on God, even though it was somewhat of a mystery to them. They believed on him because they understood the word of God. Uh, they were able to discern truth. And, uh, you know, when you think about Thomas and uh, Jesus and the encounter that followed after the resurrection of Christ, and Thomas uh, came into the presence of the disciples uh, the first time he was not there, but the second time he was there. And he said, you know, he had said that I won't believe unless I can uh, touch the print of the nail and thrust my hand into his side. He said, I won't believe. But the Bible says these people believed. And Jesus said, blessed are you uh, because you believe without touching. Now we're going to call on Dennis Morris, if you will. And Dennis uh, one of the statements that Paul makes here is that they believe that gospel. How important is that? Most important. Of course, we've got to believe it. When we hear it, that produces faith. And as a result of an obedient faith, we then act upon those things that we're told to do. We find over in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, that the apostle Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Notice here it talks about to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. There are only two categories of people, and that would be Jew and Gentile. And if you weren't a Jew, you were Gentile. So these Greeks then fell into the category of being Gentiles. 
And so should we say then that the gospel is preached to the Jews and the Gentiles alike? And there's only one gospel for both. And as a result of that one gospel being preached, then we can hear it and believe it and obey it. And as Paul said, be saved by it because it is God's power unto salvation. Take an opportunity to read through the Gospel of John and you'll find on a number of different occasions that John states that many people believed in Jesus. So many of the Jews believed in Jesus and we find one particular point there made in John chapter 2 and verse 32. So people were willing to listen, hear what Jesus had to say and as a result of what he was able to do and what he said, People believed on him. Matter of fact, that's the reason why we have the Gospel of John, that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you might have life through his name. We also find, however, that there were those who believed in Jesus and yet they were not willing to confess him because they were afraid. Afraid of what? They were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. And so when you talk about not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, not being ashamed of that message about Jesus, uh, we must be willing to let people know that Jesus indeed is the Son of God. We must be willing to confess Him before men. And if we do, He'll confess us before His Father. But some would not do that. As a matter of fact, there in John, John chapter 12 and verse 42, it states the fact that many were afraid to confess Christ because they were concerned about being put out of the synagogue. The gospel was so far reaching, not only was it preached to the Jews, it was also preached to the Gentiles, and it even went into Caesar's house. And so when you think about the far reaching effect of the proclamation of the gospel, we should not put any limit on the gospel because of its power. It can reach everyone who is willing to listen and who is willing to obey. There are times when people will hear the gospel and receive it. There are times when people will not do so. But we need to understand the eternal consequences associated with our acceptance of our rejection of that gospel. Let's make sure that we're those kind of people who are willing to accept it, believe it, obey it, and be saved by it. Brother Dan. Well, that's really the key, isn't it? Not just to hear it, not just to believe it, but to obey it. And you know, someday when we do that, we'll be able to be received up in glory like our Christ, like the Son of Almighty God. Do you know the Bible in the book of Acts chapter 19 talks about people that were baptized, but they'd been baptized under John's baptism? They'd not even heard about the Holy Spirit. It was a mystery to them. But the Bible says, when they heard, listen to it, when they heard the Word of God, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you are in question this morning about your baptism and your obedience to Christ, I hope you'll obey him. Please write or call for the DVD, Searching for Truth. We want to go now to uh, Chris Grote, our last speaker here today. And, and Chris, tell us a little bit about what it means to be received up into glory. I'd be glad to, Dan. Thank you. And good morning to everybody. You know, when we think about the ascension of Jesus Christ, that was really the culminating thing. I mean, Jesus Christ had been born uh, in Bethlehem. He, he, he was raised up. He was presented at the temple. Um, he began his uh, ministry about 30 years of age. It led him to Calvary's cross. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day. And then he appeared to various individuals over a period of 40 days. And at the end of that, uh, right there in Acts chapter 1, you can see where he was received up into heaven again. And, and that ascension is meaningful for several reasons. Number one, it's meaningful because it signaled the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, secondly, it signified the success of his earthly ministry. Uh, all that he came here to do had been accomplished. If you look at the prayer that Jesus made in John 17, he said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Verse number four. Number three, uh, the ascension of Christ, it marked the return 
of His heavenly glory. Look at verse 5. He says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with Yourself with the glory which I had with You before the world was. We got a taste of that in, in Matthew 17, 1 through 5, when He was transfigured before Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. But, but now we, we know He was glorified, that that was returned to Him because Peter said in Acts 2 and verse number 33 that He was exalted to the right hand of God. Finally, we think about the ascension of Jesus Christ this morning, and it symbolized His exaltation by the Father. Um, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9, He was received up in honor and given a name that was above every name. And then in Ephesians 1, 20, God is, is working a work in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. His most mighty power is seen in seating Him at the right hand of in the heavenly places far above all principality and power. And, and that, my friends, is, is the picture that Paul wants to get across to us when he says that he was received up into glory. That is the Jesus that we follow today. Back to you, Dan. You know, Chris, one of the mysteries that we find in the world today is why people won't obey the gospel why people won't become Christians. That's a mystery to me when God loves us so much. He wants to bring us to heaven. He wants us to obey Him, live the good full life, and yet people reject Him. Don't you do it. He's your only hope. I'm Dan Manuel. I've been your host today right here on Give Me the Bible, and I'd like to say along with all of our panelists, thank you for watching. Please join us next week at this same time for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.